What's good YouTube? Welcome back. Thank you for clicking onto this reaction. I hope you're looking forward to it just as much as I am. If you haven't already, head over to the content creators page. That link is in the description box down below. If you haven't already and you're enjoying our content, you know what you need to do. You need to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, but we're gonna jump straight into this one. <clears throat> so we have got the Battle of May 272 AD. How Aurelian restored the Roman Empire part two. Let's go. Hey guys, if you missed part one of this mini series, you can find it here. Following the victory over the Goths, hey Bruno, you good? The flagging morale of the Roman forces had been restored. And with a restructured Danubian frontier, Aurelian could now muster strong field armies for the campaigns ahead, without compromising the empire's security. The emperor wintered in Byzantium. Well, I hope you're enjoying it, Rudy. Thanks for staying up so late. Making preparations for the upcoming war with Zenobia, and ensuring that the borders would be protected in his absence considerable manpower was allocated to defend the Balkans against the tribes from across the Danube. Troops were stationed in Italy to prevent a possible return of the Alemanni and the mm -hmm. Iatungi. And in Narbonese Gaul, a substantial presence of imperial troops was required to guard against the Gallic Empire. Yeah, so that's a big frontier. The other ve uh, Venegoths and the other tribes that are invading, they're sort of small incursions that you can sort of deal with. Um, but the actual Ga uh, Gallic Empire seems like a big threat that could, could possibly uh, cause a lot of issues. By spring 272, Aurelian Thanks, had Rashi. mastered Hope you're his enjoying own it. army in Thrace and had completed all preparations. Zenobia, seeing that war with Aurelian was now inevitable, had her son Vabalathis declared Augustus, and had herself proclaimed Augusta, the traditional title of a Roman Empress. Oh my god! She is just so ambitious! She is, she wants it all! She wants it all! She's just killing herself and her son! She's, she's just committing suicide. That's all she's doing. You do not want these titles. You are just being so, so silly. So, so silly. Um, yeah, we've just started the streams yesterday. Uh, doing one today as well. I'm going to try and sort of do them a bit more regularly. Hope you guys enjoy. But because of the Palmarine failure to secure Bithynia, Aurelian was easily able to secure a bridgehead and march into Asia. Oh, he I sent see. A second that makes sense. To make a naval landing in Egypt under mm -hmm. the talented Marcus Aurelius Probus, the future emperor. Mm -hmm. The logistical planning and execution of this invasion marked Aurelian as one of the greatest military thinkers of the third century AD. His plan was a pincer movement on a massive scale, a true masterclass in strategic warfare war against Zenobia had two objectives. The first was to recapture those parts of the empire over which Zenobia had recently established her dominion. The most important of these were the wealthy provinces of Asia Minor, with their significant tax contribution to the coffers of the imperial government, and Egypt with its vital supply of grain. Mm-hmm. The Mediterranean. It's, it's Egypt. That grain is so important and so necessary for the vast uh, Roman Empire. Area of Syria, particularly the city of Antioch, was of secondary but still considerable importance. The Emperor's second objective was to eliminate Zenobia and to reduce the power of Palmyra so as to avoid a repeat of this dangerous situation. <laughs> <laughs> However, <the> <laughs> Aurelian knew that Syria would be heavily defended and that a prolonged war there was possible. Mm. This would prevent him from reaching Egypt by land, which he urgently needed to recover to secure a steady flow of grain 
as well as revenues from the Red Sea trade. That grain man is just this so needed. This was the main reason for his ambitious naval invasion yeah, like to open the bread a second of the front. Empire. The Roman fleet reached the Nile Delta sometime in the spring of 272. Very little is known about the campaign itself. Upon making landfall, Probus initially fought with success, but was then nearly captured. Oh no, really? Further reinforcements and he was a later uh, emperor, so like, an emperor was nearly captured once again. But yeah, it's quite interesting. Imagine if he got cap uh, captured, who, who else could have been that emperor? Helped him gain a foothold against the Palmyrene garrison, and by early June, Alexandria was safely back in Aurelian's nice. control. Nice. Probus then began operations to retake the rest of Egypt. Yes. Meanwhile, after crossing into a... Again, he's a future emperor, so I'm assuming that he's going to be able to have a lot of autonomy and be able to um, be able to move on his own, which I keep saying that's so goddamn valuable. Having someone um, you can trust to be able to just uh, implement the um, orders that you have gave them to the best degree that they can and it work. It's just so, so valuable. So, so valuable. Asia Minor, the advancing Roman column was triumphantly yeah, the riches in welcomed Egypt. Wow, by also inhabitants crazy. of Bithynia, who had successfully resisted Zenobia's domination. In Galatia, any Palmarine troops stationed there were certainly not numerous enough to stop Aurelian's army, and they quickly withdrew to the southeast, bringing valuable intelligence about Aurelian's advance. That's very smart. And they, that's the, the, the right thing to do. With the loose hegemony evaporating before him. Is keeping men, keeping body, sorry, so keeping bodies, giving intelligence, just the smartest thing you could do in that situation. The emperor was welcomed without a struggle by the citizens of Ankira, the provincial capital. I'd definitely be interested to find out more about po Probius if he was a competent general in the third century then like. After making sure that his supply lines were secure, from here he proceeded Smart. southeast towards the Cilician Gates, mm -hmm. a chasmic pass through the Taurus Mountains that connected the Anatolian Plateau with the Cilician Plains and Syria beyond. Mm. However, before he could reach the pass, his route took him to the town of Tiana in Cappadocia, which was strategically located along the route to Syria. The town refused to open its gates, but Aurelian could not afford to leave a hostile garrison along his lines of supply. So how's he going to get rid of them? Let's see. Angered, he ordered the city besieged, mm -hmm. pledging that he would not leave even a dog alive once the city had fallen. Brutal. Brutal savagery. Desirous of plunder, his soldiers pursued the siege with all the more mm. determination. The machine-like manner with which the Romans slowly choked the city over the course of several weeks spread fear among some sections of the population. With I'm surprised it's only some. Like, I'm hoping that I do that and you're terrified. You're weeping at their knees. That's what I want to accomplish there. Like... Like not not small groups being being fearsome. I want you all to fear me. The pressure mounting, Tiana capitulated when one of the frightened residents betrayed the city to the emperor by showing to him a weakness in the wall. Mm. The capital of Cappadocia was now in the emperor's hands. Nice. But Aurelian thought better of his previous intention to massacre Tiana. With an insight rare among 3rd century emperors, he realized that sparing the city would set a precedent far more potent in the coming conflict. That he has forgiveness. Has he taken a leaf out of Caesar's book? Because I think that might work. That would be very interesting. He ordered his army not to harm Tiana, thus presenting himself to the populace as a liberator mm. rather than a conqueror. But his troops were none too pleased. 
They expected to be allowed to plunder the city and angrily demanded that Aurelian stand by his promise. <sighs> this was indeed a dangerous move. Amidst the heightened political military tensions of the 3rd century, many an emperor and usurper were lynched by their own soldiers for refusing plunder. That Aurelian managed to survive this encounter reflects his ability to foster strong relations with his soldiers at a time okay. when armies were prone to rebellion against their commanders. Nice, he was able to turn it around. Not what did he say? to be intimidated by his men, the Emperor admitted that he had indeed ordered that no dog in Tiana be allowed to live. Accordingly, he ordered his <laughs> soldiers to kill all dogs in the city. I mean, if you had a dog, you would be upset and you would, I would, I would fucking, I would cry. But, dog or family, dog or family, well, I couldn't choose, I couldn't choose, but if there's a knife to your neck, it, like, like, and your possessions, I'd, if it's my possessions, you can take all my possessions, I'll keep my dog. If it's my, if it's my life, you, you can take my life. But if it's someone else's life, that's a different story. But possessions, so on and so forth. Um, but it was a nice play by Aurelian. The anger of the soldiers was dispelled by their laughter at this response. Hmm. Aurelian hmm. went on to explain his decision to the troops. Oh, nice. So he was, he was able to make them laugh. And then I think he's able to then, because the tensions are now slower, not even kill the dogs. We waged war to free these cities. If we pillage them, they will never trust us. This yeah, display right. of sound right. political judgment showed that he understood that Zenobia was a formidable foe and that he had better chances of defeating her through clemency rather than terror. With the capture of Tiana, the way to Syria now lay open. Aurelian's army marched into Cilicia without resistance, mm. likely passing through Tarsus, the provincial capital, before heading east through Issus, where Alexander the Great had won his famous victory over the Persians. Okay. From here, the Roman Emperor reached the port of Alexandretta. Although he had gained control over Asia Minor with relative ease, before him now lay Syria, the heartland of Palmarine power. And this is where um, he said that there's going to be ferocious fighting and a long, uh, drawn-out warfare, right? So how long does it last? Meanwhile, in Egypt, really? Probus managed to topple the resistance and regain control of the province. Nice, Probus doing he then bits. To march That's what we like to see. The Levant. He pressed the Palmarines from the... It is just always so much more impressive when there's two great generals on the battlefield for the side you're rooting for. Um, or just in general, when there's just multiple generals on the battlefield all independently doing well, it just makes so much more... in su Such a... A much more interesting dynamic in in the historical offense when you have so many capable people all doing their own thing because you're not sure what's going to happen next the south and perhaps secured the loyalty of the Cyrenian third legion in Arabia which had been previously subdued and its general killed by Zenobia to address this, Zabdas detached a considerable force in anticipation of Probus's advance on Palmyra. Mm -hmm. Having lost Alexandria, the queen now had one remaining mint under her control in Antioch. Is that Knowing it? that this would be Aurelian's first objective in Syria, it was here that she and her generals stationed Palmyra's forces in preparation for the Roman advance. I'm surprised they didn't try and take the money from the mint and, and like set up a new mint somewhere. I don't know. Probably they probably didn't have time. I'm probably underestimating how long that would take. Um, but I definitely would have looked into that possible situation. Aurelian's army consisted of legionary detachments drawn from Raetia, Noricum, Pannonia, and Moesia as well as Praetorians and Moorish and Dalmatian cavalry, 
who served as elite mounted units. Okay. Zabda's army consisted of Palmarines and other Syrians, but also various other Roman units that had declared their loyalty to Queen Zenobia's family. Okay. Palmyra's greatest advantage got a larger over force, Aurelian's force. army was the He's got a larger force at the moment because obviously Pro Probius has got a force uh, in Egypt. For, so I forgot that for a second, but yeah. They're okay. Clebanari or And then of course they're also, they've also got a general up in uh, the G Germanic Empire. So of course they've got troops everywhere else. So this is just a small contingent. These mounted units were better armored and more numerous than Aurelian's Dalmatians mm -hmm. and Moors. The Roman Emperor began crossing over the mountains. He had received unwelcome reports that the Palmarines lay between him and Antioch. Zabdas drew up his army in the Orontes Plain, on the western side of the Lake of Antioch, to the north of the city. Okay. Here, he could intercept Aurelian's advance along the road from Alexandretta, at a narrow point where the flat terrain was especially well suited to the battle tactics of the Palmarine heavy mailed cavalry. Mm. However, Aurelian refused to fight Zabdas on the battlefield of his own choosing. Knowing that a direct assault would be to surrender operational and tactical advantage to the enemy, he instead decided to march to the east of the lake, seeking to outflank the Palmarine position. Okay, that's interesting. This maneuver had three advantages. First, the Palmarines anticipated a frontal assault from the north, and yeah, of course. I, I, I was thinking maybe not the north. I was definitely thinking of trying to do something different. But it's interesting that he's going on to the other side of the lake. I become confused by an attack from their rear. Second, he would block the enemy's line of retreat to the east, and if he could reach the city. He could also cruise off the road leading south. Lastly, the terrain yeah, south of the lake was less suited to Zabda's formidable cataphracts. However, the Palmarine general got wind of Aurelian's maneuver. Okay. Having so already he do, stationed then? a small contingent to guard the road to Baroya, he sent his elite heavy cavalry to bolster their ranks. Mm. He could ill afford to lose his line of retreat. So it was imperative that they intercept Aurelian's army on the plain to the east of the lake before they could reach the hilly terrain further south, where his cavalry would be at a disadvantage. The Emperor's scouts soon brought back reports of Palmarine movements. Realizing he had lost the element of surprise, Aurelian led most of his cavalry ahead of the main body of the army. He was well aware of the fearsome reputation of the Clibonari and did not want to risk his infantry against Zabdas's heavy cavalry. Very smart by Aurelian here. It was a hot June morning. The Roman Emperor marched at pace well ahead of the rest of the army with a cavalry contingent of around 5,000 strong, hoping to outflank Zabdas at Antioch. Mm -hmm. With him, he had the veteran Dalmatian and Moorish light cavalry, which had been under Aurelian's command for a number of years before he became emperor, serving as the elite cavalry arm of the Roman army. Deadly loyal to him as well. I hope they these boys are strong. They were a astute branch of the military, capable of executing battle plans across vast distances with precision. Nice. And That's what you need. Participated in numerous campaigns, Experience. often being the deciding factor in major engagements. Mm -hmm. However, Aurelian found that his way was blocked by the Palmarine heavily armored cavalry, arrayed on the Antioch Baroya Road. Zabdas's cataphracts were of even better quality than Aurelian's Dalmatians and Moors. These troops had been forged in the fire of the Persian Wars Ooh, and perhaps okay. represented the very pinnacle of cavalry warfare in the 3rd century Ooh, AD. Okay, this is going to be it tough. It is likely that Zabdas fielded up to 5,000 of these troops at Ime, but their exact strength and composition remains unclear. 
Okay. The Palmarines traditionally used light cavalry and dromedary archers, so it is possible that these heavy cavalry units were not local and were in fact cataphracts of the Roman army in the east, which were controlled by Queen Zenobia. Mm. Rome employed such units as an answer to Persian cataphracts, and they would have been controlled by Zenobia's husband before he was assassinated. Okay, so they're once again, they're deadly loyal. This further confirms that the conflict between Rome and Palmyra was in fact a civil war. Once again, a civil war. Okay, then. Despite this, ancient sources descended from Aurelian's propaganda portrayed Palmyra as an external enemy, even though they were an integral part of the empire for centuries. Yeah, that was interesting that um, they were considered, uh, he considered them an outside external threat and not, not a civil war. That is very interesting. Further evidence of this propaganda can be seen in their portrayal of Zenobia as an Eastern barbarian, a foreigner, despite her family having senatorial status. The fact that she was of Syrian descent was clearly used against her by the central imperial government. Aurelian presented Zenobia's son as an illegitimate ruler, but ironically it was Aurelian himself who lacked senatorial status before he took power once again just using that propaganda to make your position better people always doing it just always always doing it he was an illyrian general who killed his way to the throne overthrowing quintilius and according to some sources he played a role in the assassination of mm. emperor gallienus very Aurelian interesting did eventually get senatorial support but he had earned it through brute force. He definitely earned it through brute force. Likewise, the troops from both armies used to be part of the Roman military before the war. At Ime, the two commanders fielded their best mounted contingents, both understanding the importance of the opening encounter. Around mid-morning, Aurelian gave the signal. Okay, what's he gonna On do? On the other end, Zabdas rose to the challenge. Undoubtedly, the heavily armoured cataphracts were encouraged, seeing the light Dalmatian and Moorish cavalry. Little did they know that Aurelian was the enemy. He instructed his men to wheel about and not risk close quarters combat okay. with their heavier counterparts. Nice. The light armed cavalry feigned retreat inviting the enemy to give chase. This encouraged the Palmarines to press forward in anticipation of an easy victory. Mm -hmm. Whenever a minor clash occurred, Aurelian's lighter units would flee. With each charge of Zabdas's cataphracts, the nimble Dalmatians and Moors used oh, their see. speed to avoid the confrontation and retreat along the main road towards the, other the town horses of and then they're getting fatigued. The Palmarines pursued the Romans for several kilometers. Soon enough, the Syrian midday sun began taking its mm. toll. True to the word, Clebanarius, meaning oven man, the Palmarine Clebanari and their horses suffered in the heat, having maintained the chase in their heavy armor. Mm. Aurelian noticed the exhaustion of the enemy. Turned around. On cue, Let's go, he Aurelian. His cavalry and countercharged the pursuers. That's it. Let's go. Taken by surprise, the Clebanari could not put up an effective resistance, nor flee their nimble. No, enemy. they couldn't run it, but they couldn't flee. The slaughter was terrible. The tired, heavy horsemen were either slain in their saddles or thrown off their horses mm. and mangled by the hooves of friend and foe. Ah! Imagine getting trampled on. Imagine getting trampled on. It's nearly as bad as what the Mongols used to do. Wrap you up in a carpet and just like get horses to run all, like, across you. But like imagine being in a battlefield coming off of your horse and just being trampled apart or oh, squashed. Oh. You managed oh. to escape the carnage and find their way back to Antioch. 
Aurelian's tactics at Ime relied on the veteran Dalmatian and Moorish cavalry. Their steely discipline, courage, and their ability to coordinate an effective and timely counterattack after retreating a great distance. Their deadly efficiency demonstrated the Emperor's tactical expertise, as well as his experience as a cavalry commander. Mm. In one fell swoop, he had dealt a crippling blow to Palmyra's most powerful military asset, their vaunted heavily armored cavalry. Mm, However, that he further did. to the south, the Palmyrene still possessed cavalry that far outnumbered those available to the Emperor, including a reserve of cataphracts. Aurelian knew that the battle had by no means secured the defeat of Zenobia's regime, and that the outcome of the war was yet to be decided. Nah, it was just a start. It was just that, because that was only like a small cavalry contingent as well, wasn't it? So we've still got a fair bit to go. ...goes to our awesome patrons who make videos like this one possible. History Marsh makes amazing content. I really do enjoy this. Just having a little quick read of some of these footnotes.